Hello everyone, and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark, and I'll be taking you through MSK Back, Spinal Nerves, and Autonomics 2 today. To start things off, I'm just going to give you another quick refresher of what we're talking about in regards to our spinal nerves. Um, again, we talked about our sensory nerves coming in this way through the dorsal pathway, the motor going out the ventral, and then the sympathetic autonomic um, going out from the lateral horn down through the ventral pathway, the white ray macumunicans to its central hub, the dorsal root ganglion, and then exiting for associated organs down to the lower abdomen and pelvis, and then also to our upper heads, and then to the body wall via the gray ray macumunicans to get out for our skin, erect our pillow muscles, uh, sweat glands, as well as our blood vessels to constrict to get blood back to our heart in areas such as uh, Alaska or cold areas and stuff like that. And so that's uh, kind of the breakdown of our spinal nerves. So now what we're going to be discussing is more of our clinical related anatomy and how that goes. And so some of the things as we were talking about sensory, sensory is coming from different areas in our body, such as our head and our scalp and our neck, shoulders and arms, our chest and abdomen, our lower legs, and also the genital organs. Uh, and so uh, this is kind of the body wall sensories, and each of these sensories travel along with what we call dermatomes. And dermatomes are sensory areas uh, of different nerve roots. It's coming from, you know, C2, 3, 4, and they're actually labeling all the spinal nerves that come out that provide sensory from these different areas. And they all have these kind of mapped out things, and this is called a dermatome map. But there are just a few that are actually important for you to remember at this time. And so uh, as we kind of start from the head and go down, there's just a few kind of landmarks that you can kind of pinpoint where you're located. So as far as the face, this is more of your neuro material you will be learning in term two that comes from our V1, two, and three branches, uh, our ophthalmic, our maxillary, and our mandibular branches of our cranial nerve five, which is what the V is for. It's actually a five, three, and five, one, and two. Um, but this is your trigeminal nerve. But we'll be talking about that in your second term in neuro when you get to cranial nerves. But for now, we're talking about spinal nerves. And so that pretty much is gonna be starting at C1 and two. C1 doesn't really do much sensory, it's just pretty much motor for a few of the neck muscles. But C2 allows for sensory on the back of the head and three and four uh, allows for like high turtleneck collar and low collar shirt and stuff like that. That's kind of how you can remember those ones. That's not super important necessarily. You might not ever get a question, but um, you know, if you're on the wards in your third year on rotations, uh, I know it's far away from now, but you can simply refer back to this for a shortcut to remember those dermatomes. But as far as from here on out, you should know these reference points, which is pretty much the remaining here. And so T4, uh, which is found here, is going to be at the nipple height. Um, that's a very important reference point. So above that is, uh, and below the C4 is going to be where your C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1 through 3 are going to be found. And these are very important because uh, the, this kind of comes into your upper limb section, which is the neck section. And please remember to check out our videos when I post those for you guys. But that's something that's going to reference the nerves uh, that are found in your upper limb, in addition to why we also have referred pain from our chest that goes to our arm, because we have this T1 dermatome that hits our arm. So if you have uh, ever have a patient or a clinical vignette that describes someone having a heart attack uh, and it radiates to the left arm, it's because it's kind of getting this referred pain from T1 and the brain is messing it up. Is it coming from the body wall or the arm itself, or is it coming from the heart because they share those nerves? And uh, again, we'll cover that more when we get to the thoracic organs and the heart section when you do cardiovascular. Uh, the next dermatome that's kind of a landmark is the bottom of the xiphoid processes are T7, which is found right here. So the xiphoid process is the very bottom piece of our sternum, uh, and that's kind of a, a nice important reference point for our sensory dermatomes. And then when we get into our abdomen, the most important one is going to be obviously around our umbilicus, which is found right here, and that's going to be our T10. And this is actually very important referral pain for different parts of our body, including our ovaries in females and testicles in males. Someone kicks you in the nuts. Um, 
then you're gonna have that referred pain up to your umbilicus, in addition to things like your appendix. If you have someone with appendicitis, this is why the pain starts in this periumbilical area um, and then migrates later because that uh, appendix is actually, actually rubbing up on the abdominal wall in this lower right quadrant. But uh, all these areas, the appendix and part of the small intestines, the testicles, um, all these things actually started developing in this area. So they picked up the nerves and then if they traveled anywhere, they took them with it. Um, and so that's just something like a reference point for a lot of referred pain things. In addition, that's the dermatomal area that you can make this kind of map around the person and know where T10 is. And then later, uh, or lower down in the abdomen, we have our L1, which is the inguinal ligament. And this is an important kind of reference point of sensory when someone has a herniation uh, of around your inguinal, so inguinal hernia. And uh, we will cover that uh, in your abdominal section in term two, uh, when you get to uh, abdominal wall before you start doing abdominal organs. Uh, and that will be covered in that video. And I've already kind of posted that, so you all, uh, again, refresh and post that for you come the time in your term two. And then L4, this is something that kind of travels down in the leg. So L3 and L4 go over the kneecaps and around in the knee. And those are important uh, kind of areas for reflexes uh, of our patellar reflex. So if you hit someone uh, in the knee, it's gonna be L3, L4, kick the door. Uh, and so that's when I hit that patellar ligament, that's the nerve that's gonna be sensing from that area. And then la lastly, something a little extra is your S234, it keeps the penis off the floor. Um, and so that's gonna be your sensation for erection uh, of the penile and, and anal areas as well uh, uh, in, in humans. Okay, now that we kind of broke down, we're gonna do a last couple things of arterial supply for the spinal cord and then uh, it's straight clinical from there on out. So uh, when we have our spinal cord, some certain things to know are like where are, where's the blood supply to our spinal cord coming from? And so it's nice to remember that we have these segmental arteries. Segmental arteries come straight off of the big giant aorta. And uh, that's important to know. The aorta gives off the segmental artery and that's gonna supply the both, both posterior uh, spinal medullary arteries and posterior spinal arteries that supplies pretty much this area and this area of the spinal cord. And all we're left with is this large anterior portion, which is gonna be your anterior spinal. Now anterior spinal has a little bit of anastomosis that comes off of the dorsal root or, and the segmental artery, I mean, um, not the dorsal root, but the segmental artery. But most of it actually is from anterior spinal artery which comes off of vertebral. Now we've talked about this in our last video a little bit. We have our subclavian uh, that comes off of our aorta um, and uh, the subclavian is gonna continue down towards your axillary and then for your hand. So I'm gonna draw a little hand and then uh, that's a wonderful hand. Um, uh, that almost looks like a bush, but yeah, that's my wonderful hand drawing. And off your subclavian, you give off the vertebrals. And the vertebrals, remember your vertebral arteries are the ones that go through the rings in your uh, cervical spines. Um, and remember I pointed out those, those rings, that's what artery is actually running up through those. So they go up in towards your brain and they uh, come up this way. They come up this way and then this is gonna supply, I know this picture is upside down, this is your brain upside down this way. This is towards brain, okay? And just before it fuses to make the basal artery on the surface of the pons, uh, it actually gives off the anterior spinal and that's going to come back down the spinal cord to supply this area of the spinal cord and if we actually kind of occlude this this is a problem we're going to lose a lot of our motor function in our spinal cord um, all right, now a couple nerves that kind of come into clinical significance. I'm gonna point these out. The first one, not necessarily, but it's nice to know that the dorsal scapular is a nerve uh, that comes off of C5 uh, five, and it, it innervates your rhomboid major and minor, which are muscles that pull your scapulas together. Um, if you want to practice uh, squishing cans with your scapulas, you're using those muscles. My sister can actually do that. It's kind of weird, uh, but she can wing her scapulas and crush a can in between them. Uh, but the muscles that are squeezing those together are your rhomboids. And then you also have your levator scapulae, which attaches to the base of your skull and lifts up your scapula. Um, and then we also um, have the long thoracic. Now this is a question that's gonna come up on your test and you're gonna get a free point because I'm gonna tell you this right now. So C5, 6, and 7 are the first three roots out of five 
that come from your brachial plexus. So brachial plexus is C5 through T1. Um, so C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1 is going to be where your um, brachial plexus comes off to supply your arm. But off the first three, five, six, and seven, is where you get this long thoracic nerve. And this will again come up in upper limb, but uh, this is important for your serratus anterior muscle. And uh, what happens if I damage this nerve, we're gonna have a winged scapula, and the person is gonna have trouble moving their arm uh, 90 degrees or uh, up over their head. And so I'm gonna describe this to you actually. Um, so let me switch over to our uh, essentials anatomy and I'm going to show you this muscle and what it's doing and then um, we'll come back to associate it with uh, how to answer that question. All right, so here we are with essentials anatomy and I just want to kind of point out a few things here. So we have our person that we're looking at here and what we're looking at is actually this muscle right here. This is your serratus anterior and this is the muscle. It's very beautiful muscle has all these serrations, that's why we call it this, um, and it's very important for limb movement. And you might be looking at it going, okay, I see it attaching to all the ribs here, and I see its other attachment is kind of the medial and uh, deep area of our scapula back here. It doesn't actually attach to the arm. So there's no way that this actually uh, pretty much lifts up your humerus to reach over 90 degrees itself, uh, however, what this does is it allows for protraction of your scapula, allowing for your arm to kind of get out from under bony processes, allowing for appropriate lift over 90 degrees. And so what I mean by this, I want you to kind of think uh, of this right now and practice this uh, on your own. So take your arm, sit up straight away from your chair. Don't let anything behind you like uh, the back of the chair and take your arm and go all the way back, extend it all the way back behind you straight out all the way back, how high can you lift your arm? I can only lift it not even 90 degrees from my body. I cannot lift it back very far. It just kind of gets stuck. And so just imagine Superman uh, in a building and he's trying to fly. And as he jumps up, he hits the ceiling of the roof. Well, the ceiling of the roof is actually pretty much this bonus process. Uh, so if you can see all these different things, the chromial process and the clavicle are on top of your arm. And so when the humerus lifts back, it kind of hits this. Now this is, isn't exactly what's happening here. It's just the muscles don't allow it to do this, but I think of it in this way, that it's under this roof. And what it needs to do is actually go outside in order for him to fly up into the sky. Yes, we know Superman could probably break through the ceiling, but he doesn't want to do that. So we need to get our arm out from under this uh, canopy or out from under this roof, and then he can fly straight up into the sky and lift our arm up into the sky. So what do we need to do now that you have your arm kind of sticking out behind you and it can't lift, how about you take your arm out to the side all the way to your side as if you fully abducted your arm out 90 degrees. Now, now that you have your arm out to your side and you lift your arm, can you actually lift it all the way up over your head? Absolutely. So what the difference was, is your hand, what arm was behind, your scapula was retracted towards a vertebra. But this muscle, serratus anterior, brings your arm out in front and then allows you to lift this up. So uh, the arm originally kind of goes up this way and gets stuck, uh, you know, uh, like at this height. So this is the arm. This is the arm with the little hands at the end. Okay. Um, however, what we need to do is we need to bring this around this direction. And now this arm can lift all the way up in this direction. And how do I bring it? This is this muscle. Serratus anterior does this motion of bringing your entire scapula over, which your humerus is attached to your scapula at the glenoid fossa. And this allows it to get out from under this roof ceiling right here and allows you to actually lift your arm up and over your head. And that's what this muscle does. And if I cut out the nerve, the long thoracic nerve, which runs across your thorax like this, uh, long thoracic, and uh, if I cut this nerve, such as for someone I have uh, breast cancer and we cut out the breast and we're, you know, we're chopping off all this breast tissue and then whoops, we clip the long thoracic nerve. Now this person can't lift their arm over their head. Um, what will we see on physical exam? Well, they'll put their arms out in front of them on a wall, like, uh, you know, a double stop sign against the wall or, you know, the cop is frisking you against the wall sort of thing. 
And so they'll be doing push-ups against a wall. And what happens is the scapula kind of sticks out and this is called wing scapula. And that's what uh, you can remember from this. If I cut long thoracic, I can't lift my head, uh, arms over my head. And then I have wing scapula. That's my long thoracic, five, six, seven roots. Now, you might be asking, why is it winging? I don't understand this. So let's draw the thoracic cavity. I did a cross section cut between this. This is anterior, this is posterior, and I have my scapula here. This is my scapula. And I have my scap scapula back here, my two shoulder blades. And I have this muscle that attaches the anterior wall to my scapula, and this is my serratus anterior, this muscle. And on the back, we have our rhomboid muscles, which attach the vertebra, which is found here, to our scapula. And they're pulling and chugging this uh, bone to slide back and forth, back and forth along the chest wall. And it stays really tight and close around here. It's going back and forth, back and forth, protracting, retracting, protracting, retracting. That's what these muscles are doing. Rhomboids are pulling it in towards the back. Uh, serratus anterior is uh, pulling it forward. Um, and this is kind of fighting and it's sliding this along here. However, what happens if I kind of clip innervation, this muscle is nice and loosey goosey, that now the rhomboids are the only thing that's happening. And so now what happens to the scapula is it comes out like this and I have this loosey goosey serratus anterior that now you can see that this is a winged scapula. And that is actually how you get that. All right, so that's your long thoracic, serratus anterior, wing scapula, having difficulty lifting your arms over 90 degrees. That is a question free point on your test now that you know this. Next is thoracodorsal. This isn't that important except it innervates your latissimus dorsi. So just imagine uh, you're doing lat pull downs at the gym. That's what this nerve is innervating, those muscles. Your spinal accessory uh, is cranial nerve 11. Uh, and also in addition, three and four uh, kind of add to this and allows for innervation of your trapezius muscle, which is the one that actually lifts your arm over your head, not the one that just uh, protracts your scapula, but the one that actually attaches to the arm and lifts it up, the actual humerus bone itself. And then we also have the sternocleidomastoid. Uh, and that is important for having that kind of um, that turning your head up in the dramatic upwards and left position or upwards and right, you know, like dramatically into the distance of the sky, that uh, kind of uh, classic look up uh, to the top left. That's what our spinal accessory. But again, you'll kind of learn uh, that um, how they ask questions for this is someone has a stabbing in their neck and now they have trouble shrugging their shoulders or turning their head side to side. If you have that, that's your cranial nerve number 11 called spinal accessory nerve or accessory nerve. And so definitely look out to that. That again is another question right there. Now you got two points from this slide alone. Okay. So now on to tons of clinical, let's get down to the nitty gritty. So um, fractures of your cervical spine can kind of come into play as far as questions. So imagine you having someone who just tried to hang themselves and now they have severe uh, neck pain and obviously they're not dead. Uh, what is actually going wrong? You might be talking about a traumatic spondylolysis or spondy, which is the spine and lysis or breaking of your C2 vertebrae. And this is also called your hangman's fracture. Now, this is just due to hyperextension of the neck due to hanging, don't worry about that. But really what the main thing is going at is what part is actually fractured. And please remember this guy, the pars interarticularis, pars interarticularis. That's why I have it in pink and now circled in red. That's where the question comes. It's fracture of your C2 or your the one that has the dens on it, that's your axis, that pivoting point. This occurs due to hanging or increased hyperextension of the head and neck. Next is our actual Jefferson's burst. So instead of upward force, we have downward force onto um, our head and cervical spine that can fracture this. Uh, this, these are usually patients that come in after car accidents and their head went into their steering wheel or something like that. That's where you can commonly see these. Or someone jumping out of a fourth floor building landing on their head 
or uh, an injury during football when their heads collided with one another. And this is called a Jefferson burst. It's a fracture burst of your C1 vertebrae and usually occurs in multiple places. Uh, and it can, it's pretty much what happens is I have this ring structure and uh, I actually have the globe or the brain on top and the skull. And I have this is a horrible skull, by the way. Um, but uh, what happens is I have downward force on this ring and the way this is kind of working, if I draw the ring, is I actually have the this downward slanting processes on this. And if I force something down that fits into this, you can see that sliding down this slide and sliding down this slide, we're gonna be pushing this outward and that's why it kind of bursts. So these, these are the slides that go down like this. Uh, and this is the slide that goes down like this. And so when I have force down, this actually then gets pushed out this direction and that is a Jefferson burst fracture. Next is our whiplash. And now this is far more important than the last couple of slides, but uh, also a very nicely tested and messes up everybody. This is where I can really mess somebody up and that's why I'm gonna actually teach you all of this. So we have our intervertebral disc and in our intervertebral disc, we have our annulus fibrosis, which is kind of this nice fibrous band. And then we have this nucleus pulposus, which is kind of like a jelly substance. And uh, what happens if we compress and we mess up and we damage or we have some sort of um, you know, degeneration of our annulus fibrosis, that's how we get herniation. We already talked about that in our last video that described what happens to the nerve fibers and what nerve is injured between each of the areas of the vertebra. But this is what's actually happening in our intervertebral disc. Now, you might be asking, why is this um, herniation always occurring sideways to hit the nerve rather than straight back into the spinal cord? And this is because of the ligaments in our vertebra. And so this is something that's super important to understand is what are the ligaments that are gonna be found in our vertebral column. So we're actually looking at this picture from front, the front side. So we have our vertebral bodies and our spinal canal, and then our spinous process back here and our transverse process. So this is actually the thoracic region that we're looking at in this diagram. But what kind of comes into play are some of the ligaments that fall in here. And so if we go from all the way in the back, all the way forward, we'll be describing some of these ligaments. And so what are some of them is out on the very tips, the very tips of our spinous process, the most posterior thing, we have our super, our, our supraspinous ligament. Our supraspinous ligament is this little thin kind of line that runs at the end. Then we have our interspinous ligament, which is the one that runs in between our spinous processes here. And then we have, once we get through those guys, we have this one other ligament known as ligamentum flavum. And once we pop through this, we are now in our epidural space. So if you ever have someone that wants to get an epidural for pregnancy or something like that, delivering a baby, they want to be knocked out of pain, we can put something through our supraspinous, our interspinous, and then ligamentum flavum, and now we're in the epidural space. And we can kind of push that in. And now then we have our spinal cord that runs right through here. And then if I went through my spinal cord even further through, I would hit my posterior longitudinal ligament. Now this one is gonna come into play in just a second. Our posterior longitudinal ligament is um, reference to the posterior side of the body. And then our anterior longitudinal ligament is in also reference to our vertebral body, but it's on the anterior surface and it's a very large one that's found right here. So uh, if I have my vertebral body and I have my vertebral body, and then this is my spinal cord that's running through here, there's a ligament on the posterior side of this. This is my posterior uh, longitudinal ligament. And then I have one on the anterior side. That's my anterior longitudinal ligament. People always mess this up because the posterior longitudinal ligament is actually anterior to the spinal cord itself, spinal cord right here. So you can see that it's actually in front of it. But why we name it the way we name it is in reference to the vertebral bodies. So it's actually behind it. And this one's actually in front of it. Now you might be asking, uh, Clark, this is super boring. How are they asking a question? So let me tell you how they ask a question. I have someone that has a disc herniation and I see that the disc herniation goes posterior, posterior, and it goes lateral. So why is it going posterior laterally instead of directly posterior through the spinal cord? Well, it's because of this posterior longitudinal ligament running right here in the middle. It's very strong. So if I had a herniation, it would bump hit this ligament, not doing anything. Instead, it goes out to the side where it's nice and weak, 
and can herniate that direction. Um, and so that's just uh, actually what this is from. So if you ever get a question that has a, someone with a herniation, they're asking you why, uh, what ligament is causing our uh, disc to be herniating posterior laterally, be looking for posterior longitudinal ligament. And then we also have these other uh, injuries such as hyperextension or hyperflexion. And this pretty much goes to as far as uh, distance traveled of our ligaments that get injured. So if I have hyperextension, so I have my vertebral bodies here, posterior longitudinal, anterior longitudinal up this way, and then we have our supraspinous and our interspinous found in here, and then ligamentum flavin found in here. So if I were to look at someone that has hyperextension, which one of these ligaments is being stretched the most? Well, this one isn't stretching at all. It's actually shrinking up and all these ones posteriorly. However, this one on top here is being stretched a lot. So with hyperextension, it's the most anterior structure that gets damaged, and that's gonna be your anterior longitudinal ligament with hyperextension. With hyperflexion, you can see that we have our supraspinous, we have our intraspinous and our ligament to flavum, then the spinal cord and our posterior and our anterior longitudinal ligaments. Now, if I have hyperflexion, which one is being stretched the most? Well, that's gonna be your most posterior one of the entire ligamentum structures, and that is gonna be your either your supraspinous or interspinous ligaments. Those are the ones that are the furthest back there. Now, keep in mind, they're only gonna give you one of those, but just knowing that those are on the most posterior aspect as far as ligaments for your cervical vertebrae, that that comes into play as far as how to answer those questions. Okay, so we did talk about this last video, and we talked about our lumbar regions and those extra facets that allow us to differentiate them from our thoracic and our cervical vertebrae because they have that little extra sort of transverse-like process. And these are the facets, the very large facets we talked about. And uh, what happens here is this facet can actually fracture. If someone gets in a car accident and they only have a, a, a waist belt, you know, if they're in that middle seat of those old trucks with that waist belt and not an actual one that goes across the chest, uh, you can kind of have the entire top part of the body moving forward and the rest of the body kind of staying behind, lower down. And so something's going to kind of crack in half. And if it just cracks and it doesn't slide, then it's spondylolysis. If it cracks and slides forward and separates, then that's spondylolysis, which means sliding. And so what is actually breaking again, pars interarticularis, you might ask yourself, what did we, uh, what actually, or where did we actually see this before? Remember that is your hangman's fracture uh, or C2 fracture. Uh, is where we also have pars interarticularis. But spondylolysis and spondylolysis is pars interarticularis fractures, and it actually forms the Scotty dog with his collar. We want a Scotty doggy without a collar because they're nice and soft all the way around, but if we put a collar, they have that scratchy collar around the neck. We gotta move that around in order to, you know, to pet them. And so uh, spondylolysis and spondylolysis pretty much differ at that area, and it's usually in the lumbar that we see this. Uh, and let me show you a picture of what this looks like. So here's our lumbar vertebrae and here's our sacrum, our ilium, and our sacrum is going to be down here. Okay. So we're in the lumbar region. You might be going, where on earth are you talking about a Scotty dog? Well, here's his mouth and here's his legs. And I'm going to draw this for you. And here's this little tail. And so you can see this Scotty dog that's drawn right here. And here's his little eyes and his smile and his tongue that comes out like this. Okay. So there's the Scotty dog. But when we look at this Scotty dog here, does he have a collar? Absolutely, you can see this collar fractured right through the middle here. This is coming right through here. This is a nice fracture. So now he has his collar on. And so now he's actually a sad face with this and he's crying a little bit. Oh. And so this is actually spondylolysis is that fracture. And if this these vertebra were able to slide apart from each other, then that would be spondylolysis. And that's uh, something they might show you an image, find that Scotty dog, see if there's a fracture, that's spondylolysis, and then look in the stem if they say if it slid forward, then that's spondylolysis. Okay, 
So now this uh, kind of random thing that's not very important, but uh, for some reason they do like asking about this because it's a straight up anatomy question. But on our back, we have this triangle of auscultation that you will never use in actual clinical relevance, but you can if you want to at any some point. But uh, this triangle of auscultation is a nice area that doesn't have bone, doesn't have muscle kind of overlaying this. So we can nice listen to this one area of lung that doesn't really help. Um, but uh, you do have to know this is what makes up the borders. So the trapezius is gonna be our medial border, the latissimus dorsi is our uh, inferior border, and then our lateral border is gonna be the medial border of the scapula. So lateral border of scapula, medial border of scapula, medial border of scapula is actually the lateral part of this trial of uh, auscultation. Then in the lower abdomen on the back, we actually have some muscles that kind of make up a different inferior lumbar triangle. Instead of the triangle of auscultation on the upper chest and back, I mean, uh, we also have this inferior lumbar triangle, which is made up from the lateral border of your latissimus dorsi, the iliac crest as your inferior border, and then your external oblique makes this area here. And this is sort of clinically relevant, Not we don't listen in this area. Well, why this is clinically relevant is if I separate or just damage some of the tissue anywhere in this area, that this opening might open up fatter and we might have a lateral herniation. Um, so hernias can actually kind of push through this weak wall area because there's not many structures holding everything into place. So just keep that in mind um, when you're talking about the different triangles. So now on to a little bit of clinical relevance for our lumbar puncture. Um, there's some things that you should know between the difference of an infant and adult in regards to where our uh, spinal cord is gonna be found, where we should be doing lumbar puncture and kind of our anatomical uh, landmarks. In addition, what structures are we popping through in order to get to um, the CSF? And so uh, in an infant, in a newborn, uh, we're gonna be looking, because our uh, lumbar vertebrae and everything have not grown and stretched out yet, the cord is actually a lot further down. It ends at your L3, L4 level, where in an adult, our vertebrae have grown, our spinal cord stays the same size, and so it actually lifts up a little bit higher and ends around L1 or L2. And this is where, uh, this is an important thing to always be able to find your L4, L5 uh, interspinous uh, uh, base that we can do a lumbar puncture in for even an infant and an adult that's always the safe place to hit the CSF and not be damaging and stabbing the spinal cord on accident. And the place that we always look for is iliac crest. Once we have that iliac crest, we go laterally or we go medially uh, in a nice straight line that finds our L4 and L5 space and uh, allows us to kind of puncture in that area. And um, uh, this is uh, at the end of the, the conus medullaris, it's the end of the spinal cord. So we're actually gonna be stabbing uh, into this area right here in both cases, L4, L5 um, is this space. And so we'll get a nice CSF outtake from there. And you might be asking, what are we using lumbar punctures for? Well, lumbar punctures are used when we have um, patients that come in with uh, meningitis or encephalitis. And um, sometimes if they have bleeding in their brain, we can do CSF spikes. We can also inject drugs into this area for spinal anesthesia under pregnancy and such. We can do that as well. Now you might be asking, okay, well, where do you, where does the question come from? Well, there's two questions on this slide. First, where do I go for my spinal cord uh, as far as my CSF lumbar puncture? Where should I go that is gonna be a safe place? And that's gonna be highlighted in red here, L4, L5. The second is, what are the things I'm going to hit as I go through this uh, to get to the CSF with my needle? And so always remember kind of the flow of how these things go through. And uh, the first thing is that you're gonna hit is skin. And then following that, you're gonna go deeper into your uh, supraspinous ligament and then your interspinous ligament. And then finally, you're gonna hit that ligament and flavum. That's gonna be your first pop that you feel, uh, first strong pop. And now you're in the epidural space. Now you can stop right there and inject stuff in the epidural space, but you can also continue down further and you pop through the dura mater, not epidural, but dura mater. And now you're in the subdural space and then you pop through the subarachnoid space 
and the subarachnoid space is where all your CSF is going to be found. And so that's kind of the flow through here uh, that you can get to uh, in order to kind of pop and, and get through into the CSF, get some of that out, or also to inject spinal anesthesia for procedures like hip and knee replacements is when we do that. And so that's actually, uh, all you should know is pretty much when we go through this, what are, what's the last thing we pop through, which is our arachnoid motor? Uh, what's the first thing is skin? What's the first pop ligamentum flavor, uh, flavor, flavor, uh, ligamentum flavum? And then uh, where did we get that CSF from? That's your subarachnoid space. Okay, so now comes the clinical thing situation when I have an 80 year old man that comes in and he had prostate cancer and now we see metastasis in his brain. And you might ask why or where is this metastasis cancer? How is it getting from his prostate to his brain? And now this is, comes down to something different than blood supply such as arterial drainage um, or like through your liver and then it goes to your lungs, then your lungs through the heart up to your brain. Uh, it doesn't go that way and it's not through lymphatics either. However, this is through a uh, venous plexus known as your venous plexus of Batson. And so this is a venous plexus that's found all the way through your vertebral column from your pelvic area all the way to your brain. And so what happens since this system does not have any valves, it's a valveless um, uh, venous plexus. This person just has a little bit of blood coming from the prostate into the pelvic areas, the pelvic plexus, then from the pelvic plexus to the lumbar plexus, and the lumbar plexus all the way up to the cervical and the brain. And that will then allow just passive blood as this person's sleeping or whatever to flow from their prostate to their brain. And that's actually how prostate cancer can get to the brain. And so if you ever have that clinical vignette of an old guy with prostate cancer and now it's in his brain, where did it, how did it get there? It's through this venous plexus of, Blatt, uh, of Batson, uh, also called your uh, lumbar uh, venous plexus is how that gets there. All right, and then pretty much the last thing that's clinical uh, relevant is a little bit of embryological things that kind of go down, and these are actually very straightforward, and you're gonna get a free point uh, with these questions. So if you ever have a child that's born and there's this little lumpy thing on their lumbar spine that kind of projects out of the skin, uh, or there's a tuft of hair, then we're really talking about spina bifida. And spina bifida is due to uh, a neural pore not closing properly, and uh, or a neur neural tube, sorry, uh, not closing properly. And you might ask yourself, why is this? Co uh, why? What causes this? And this is when you have a folate, defic folate deficiency. So this is why we always encourage mothers to be on folate uh, before they want to conceive their their children, and um, the neural. Um, the neural tube actually ends up closing on day 28 uh, of conception. So it's actually four weeks into pregnancy. Uh, it's too late for the folate to do anything to help. It's gonna be spina bifida if there's no folate. So we always encourage to have people eating lots of fruits and vegetables, getting their prenatal vitamins before conceiving a child because even by day 28, when you might not even know you're pregnant, um, that this can actually be too late. And so when you have spina bifida, uh, pretty much just remember that it's failure of this uh, vertebral column not to, or it does not seal. And so it's neural, uh, neural tube defects, but the actual spinous process uh, is not fusing to be formed. So it leaves this kind of open space that you can see down here. We have our transverse process and we should have had a spinous process, transverse process, and we should have spinous process, but now we have this opening space. And so they might show a little, a child with just a puff of hair on the back, that's spino bifida occulta, as when you have that tuft of hair, which you can see in this little hair back here. And then we have the next one that actually protrudes out and makes a sac. And these are actually called spina bifida cystica, are the ones that make this cystic structure. But then we break it down further into the three things that are composed within this cyst. It depends on what is protruded in here. So if what actually comes out as a cyst, and it's just the meninges and CSF found in here, then it's just gonna be meningeal seal. 
meninges, and fluid. However, if the nerve fibers actually come out, then it's going to be meninges, myelo for nerve, and fluid as well. So meninges, nerve, and fluid, that's meningeal myelocele. And so that's the composition of those three things, and that's this one right here. However, if this is actually open and exposed and almost like popped open, then this is something that has been like ripped open and totally exposed. And so we have nerve opening. So myelochesis, myelochesis. Myel uh, we have our nerve exposed to air. And so this is spina bifida with myelochesis. That's when it's nerve straight out in the sac exposed to air. And this is really bad because you can get an infection right of your nerve tissue sitting right there. And that's, that's super problematic. And so that's, uh, again, from folate deficiency. Uh, by day 28, our neural tube, de uh, our neural tube closes. Um, this is fourth week. And um, we can get four different types. One is our occulta, which just means that the spinal process didn't form, but nothing projects. We just have a tuft of hair there. We have our cystica, which is composed of B, C, and D. And it just kind of depends on what's found in there. Is it just meninges and fluid? Meningocele. If it's just meninges, nerve, and fluid, it's meningeal myelocele. If it's the nerve that gets exposed, then that's myelochesis. Um, and so those are important things that are clinically re relevant, especially when you do your pediatric rotation, you might be able to see some of these guys. All right, so that pretty much closes off back and spinal nerves. That's the clinical relevance. That's the actual anatomical relevance. And that's where you get a lot of the questions that come from this area. It actually is very straightforward. Uh, in your anatomy lab, you're gonna be learning some of the structures of there. You might be seeing the nerves and such, but it actually isn't a very high yield. There's very just a very few things that you're gonna get asked questions on there, maybe about 10 questions on your exam, 10, 15 at the most, um, that are just gonna be pretty much going over what I've already discussed in this video. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and check out our further videos. When you guys start doing upper limb, I'll be covering that as well.